Hey, welcome everybody. I'm going to jump straight into my little talk to you all today. Hope you are all well. Sending love to you all. But um, yesterday, this hello bit took, you know, three, four minutes. And so when I started to chat, it went on to become longer than I wanted to be. So I just want to respect all of your time. So welcome. Thank you, all of you that are jumping in with me live. And of course, this will be saved to uh, IG stories for the next 24 hours ish. I want to speak to you guys today, you beautiful people out there in pandemic land, um, about framing. Framing. Framing is a superpower we humans have, but the problem is most people don't understand uh, that the nature of our struggles often is not with the picture which we see, it's with the framing that we don't see. If you go to um, one of these great art galleries of the world and look at the masters' pictures, Renoir or Picasso and so on, um, I know you'll see the picture, but if you'll pay attention to the frame, you will see that people... There is an absolute science and art in giving the right frame to the right picture so that you realize that the frame doesn't detract from the picture or overwhelm the picture. It is just sat perfectly around it. And that's what I want you to think about doing with, with life and certainly now with this virus thing that we're in around the world to think about to pull back from the picture, as it were, to step back from the picture you can't control and we can't often change the picture, and we spend a lot of effort on the picture when the problem isn't that the picture needs changing. It is just the perspective, the framing, the way in which we look at the picture, the mental framing, the emotional framing, the conditioning that we have and don't know we have is where we are better to spend time than trying to alter the picture and alter the situation because often that is what you can't do but what you can do is change the framing another word for framing in psychological terms guys would be cognitive biases we all have cognitive biases and i referred to this yesterday a little bit that we that we have inherited ways of looking at things and honestly this stuff is so below the radar that most of us don't know we have unhelpful frames, unhelpful frames around our eyes, as it were, around our conceptual looking at the world. Um, and these frames are good, bad and ugly. Um, these frames are to do with things as simple and yet things as complex as our nationality, our skin color, our race, our gender, our religion, our politics, um, our culture, the part of the world we were born in, our socio-economic backgrounds, our religion, our spiritual experiences, um, our theologies. All of these things create frames and we are unaware that all of our take on life, all of our perception on life is governed by a frame that we don't know we have. Um it bothers me hugely that most humans are unconscious of the psychological framing with which they view life and upon which they make decisions. And some of these decisions are life-changing and are not aware that the frame is determining a default autopilot behavior to things that required a more careful approach and are not aware that the framing is choosing these behaviors and these outcomes and these decisions and these perceptions and these results are because a fixed frame is in place and we slash away at the foliage, as it were, of the picture and the foliage of the context and the foliage of the situation and nothing changes. And it's exhausting to keep trying to change the picture when the problem all along was the framing. And so <laughs> there is no such thing as, as a view of life from everywhere or nowhere. Everyone is viewing life and doing life from somewhere and from, and from something that we don't know often we have because these frames are established for us 
when we weren't looking. The first 10 years of all of our lives as humans were lived blind. And often some of the framing that we battle with later in life, we do not know, came from um, a part of our life that was formative when we had zero resistance to what was being decided on our behalf. And parents who didn't unlearn their poor framing passed on their poor framing to children and then to children's children. So what happens is these flawed ways of looking at life based on flawed value systems that were never unlearned and were never spotted, these blind spots about framing default modes get passed on to children. So parents that were ignorant pass on their frames to kids that were ignorant and so it goes on and no one says to us ever, excuse me, the problem is with the framing. So when Jesus appears on the stage of history, the frame they had about what to expect he would look like, a Messiah would look like, a deliverer would look like, divine intervention would look like, which was the hope and the prayers of the Jews for generations. And their idea of what he would look like was nothing like Jesus looked like. And what we had in Jesus' generation and every generation since then about things that really matter to our humanity is that the very answer to our prayers is in front of us. That God did show up, that the answer did arrive, that heaven did respond, that the breakthrough did come. But because it did not come in a, in a form that our frame would recognize, we didn't see it. And so we kept on resisting the very thing that was the answer and the resolve and the result was right there. And the people were right there and the answer was right there. But we kept pushing beyond it, pretending and behaving like nothing had happened. And it's exhausting to continue believing for rescue when rescue has already come. And what caused us not to be able to see it was that our framing got us to look for something, got us to live tuned into a frequency, and the answer was not broadcasting on the frequency we were locked into. And the frequency is another way metaphorically be saying to you guys, the frequency is the frame that we locked into of how we think things should happen. And so our cultural biases and our life stage biases, I am in my midlife and my midlife my white Anglo-Saxon midlife version of me <laughs> gives me, if I'm not careful, default framing that prevents me from relating to people different to me. And since I've traveled more in the last 10 years around the world and spent more time in the shoes and immersed myself more in the different cultures around the world, I become aware even at my massive cultural blind spots that are causing me to frame some people out of my connectivity because I'm speaking and communicating with a frame that I think is the only one I need. And I think in life, the idea is to keep upgrading your frame, not in grand ways. If it's a massive upgrade we need, we've probably left it too late and it's exhausting to make the leap. So I'm advocating small incremental tweaks all the time to our sense of framing so that we are constantly taking on new nuances that make our framing as up-to-date as it can be because we are listening and thinking broader than the life that we're living, the demographic that we are, the skin color that we are, the age group that we are, the faith and religious denomination tribe that we are. All of that will give us a set frame that may have been good then, but it's not good now. And this is why Jesus would step into the culture he was in and say, you have heard it said. That's the frame you've all had. But I want to give you an upgraded reference point, an upgrade on your framing. And he would give them a new idea. And the idea was so drastic when he said, hey, instead of trying not to murder someone and stopping short of murder, um, why don't you just try less hate? And he moves everything from, he moves everything from trying to um, stay tolerant and stay short of getting to the point where you do something crazy because of hate, 
and he's moving it all to an internal ecosystem and saying, hey, here's a new frame. Why don't you try to love more and hate less and the outcome of that will be less murder. And the outcome of this will be less crime and less stealing. And if you, if you move this all to an internal belief system that is a new frame of reference for life, we won't need the Ten Commandments to keep us inside the borders um, of human decency. And of course, in his day and even now, to say something as radical as that is to suggest that you're f not the pitch is wrong here. The complete frame is wrong. And many of you out there are in the business of this. Your whole, your whole output, your whole connectivity, your whole relevance depends on upgrading your frame. And I think in the church world, guys, we have been terrible at the awareness that our framing is wrong. The pitch is not the problem. The utter frame is wrong. And I think if we in the church do not do not stay intentional about upgrading our frame, even if it's a nuanced thing, then we eventually incrementally get further and further behind. Our connectivity depletes and and, and reduces and we finish up in an echo chamber speaking only to people that have the same frame as us the same frame as us being the one that we should have upgraded years ago so i appeal to preachers to pastors to leaders around the world to me to be constantly aware i'm in conversations all the time and i'm aware when i do q a around the world that i do a lot recently in my events i'm so aware <laughs> The, the questioner is asking me the question from an utterly different frame from which I'm about to answer. And my answer makes me appear uncaring and unkind, even rude um, and unhelpfully disruptive. And I'm aware when the questioner continues to question me because my first answer wasn't sufficient, that we could be there all day and I will never be sufficient in my answer because the problem is we have two different frames going on here. That I am answering it from a completely different perspective to the person that's asking me the question. And so we have this bypass in the room. And of course, this is going on at a global level. This is going on with governments to us and with organizations and with businesses and with churches to us. There's a massive impasse when we don't understand the language of the people that we're speaking to, then we have a frame issue. And I want to be diligent, and especially I think at this time around the world, how we frame the virus. I've had all kinds of stuff, and you'll do whatever you do to frame this well. But if you frame this poorly, it will kick your butt. It will, it will kill us. Um, the virus won't kill us. Our framing of it will kill us and it will intimidate us and it will shut us down and narrow our options and make us miserable because we didn't frame this time well, I suppose. And so this requires great courage, guys. I know this requires courage for us to do this work, especially if you feel that your frame is being threatened right now, especially if you feel that this is the problem. And you think, where do I go to get a better frame? Well, where you go is you listen wider, you relate wider, you listen to people that you have historically said, I can't learn from those people who you've demonized. Some of these voices are the people that are going to be most helpful to us in our framing because they are the voices that are the majority often and they are the voices often of our future. I think if you didn't spend enough time in the shoes of the people that you want to be your future church or business or clients or customers or voters or supporters or volunteers, if you don't spend more time in their shoes ongoingly with a progressive head about it, then we incrementally drift away from connectivity and finish up back again in a small echo chamber of the people that share our own, our own cognitive biases. And this is not good for humanity. It is not good for any progressive organizations. It's certainly not good for we in the church. So I think one of the gifts of this virus, if I could frame it that way, is that it will help us think about our frame rather than think about the picture. Is your frame serving you? Is your frame helpful to you um, for this next season of your life? Because this is going to be fairly long term is the impression we're getting, eh? 
So you now have chance. You've got to be still. I think stillness is good for, for frame upgrades. I think stillness favors frame change. So in the stillness that we have, where we have the time and attention now to give to this, maybe you could get far enough back. Maybe you can sit far enough back in your consciousness to perceive the flawed, faulty framing with which we are doing life, doing marriage, doing friendship, doing parenting, doing leadership, doing humanity. I think this is a good time to have a frame change. And you know, um, I want to say finally, let you guys go and appreciate your time. Um, reason and, and rationality, I think, work well inside the frame you have. But they don't work well um, between frames. What works well when you're changing frames isn't logic, reason, and rationality, but imagination, curiosity, fascination, open-mindedness. That They are better attributes to have when you are changing frames than logic and rationality and reason. Because some of the frames you need to shift to, we need to shift to, um, are not reasonable. Some of the upgrades we need to make are not rational based on the rationale with which you got the frame you've got. So, so I want you to exchange logic and rationality for curiosity and imagination between frames because that will help you let go of your attachment to where you got the last frame from because a lot of the new framing is not going to sit well with left brain logic. It will only sit well with right brain creativity, which, by the way, I think is one of the marks of the emerging generation. My generation with left brain logic, and we created our frames based on that. And I've had to teach myself an old dog new tricks, and that's what this becomes. I've had to teach myself, and still am, that I need to move much more from my right brain creativity and open-mindedness, and my right brain, my right brain um, compassion and empathy, I need to much more lift from that and my curiosity than my left brain logic. And so if you're between frames and I want you to be, then look for those in yourself rather than this doesn't fit with my, no, it won't fit. And you, so you need imagination. I dare you, I dare you guys to cut loose <laughs> from your attachment to your framing. I dare you to cut loose from your skin color attachment from your demograph, from your life stage, from your gender, uh, from your political biases. I dare you to cut loose from it, to untether and just take off and see what comes up in your humanity. See what blockages come up in your soul and ask yourself, is that okay? Is that all right? And if you think it's not all right, then this is telling you, yeah, that hasn't served you well. Let go of your frame and be open for a new one. All right. Hey, listen, love you guys. Thank you for your time and attention again today. I'll do this for a few more days, but as I said yesterday, uh, it's a fine line between tragedy and learning, and I don't want to step into this line too soon. Uh, tragedy often and crisis lives longer uh, for some of us than does our willingness to learn. So if I'm coming in too early before learning has awoken in you, I apologize. And if my voice is not helpful in your feed, Call and cut my voice from your feed. I don't want to be unhelpful at this time. If you're going through crisis, still reeling from how this thing's affected you, I'm sorry. And my heart goes out to you guys. Um, and if this, you know, personal development stuff is too early because you're still in the crisis um, level of this because it's...